Alrighty, race fans, welcome to another edition of My Favorite Parts. In today's episode, we're going to talk about armatures and bushings. So if you've been following us, uh, we've worked our way from the front of the slot car on back. We first talked about chassis and what goes on with them, guide pins, got into the electrics and pickups, things like that. Uh, we just finished up with magnets, and now we're going to look at armatures and bushings and how all that, you know, works together to create a certain package. So let's get into it. All right, so let's dive into armatures here. Um, the, uh, the last episode, you know, we talked about uh, motor magnets and traction magnets and focused a lot on uh, traction magnets. We'll talk a little bit more about motor magnets and because it, it, they do have some direct bearing on an armature or an armature direct bearing on a motor magnet. So uh, we've got just a couple examples of stuff here. So. Let's, uh, let's get some, a little closer up here. An armature is essentially an electromagnet. Um, I can't waste a lot of time talking about how and why they work. They just kind of do. The internet's full of resources that you can look at on the uh, means and methods and functioning of a DC armature. Ours happens to be a three-pole motor, and uh, other more complicated motors may be five, six, ten, whatever it is that they need to do to accomplish a certain uh, task. But ours is uh, a three-pole. That's been kind of tradition for us, uh, even in the larger scales. Uh, three-pole motors are very common. Uh, so this right here, that's what an armature blank, that's what we call an armature blank, looks like before you put the wire on it, okay? And armatures are made up of laminations, okay? So this particular one is a 21 lamination blank. So there's 21 little pieces of stamped out steel that are stacked up in here and then they powder coat it. And you might ask why don't they just have one piece of machine steel? Well, it would make a very good armature and if you look up um, why laminations work and study that, um, then you'll understand. And by the way, when they do punch these things out, they're coated, so there's, there's a thin coating on them that kind of insulates them electrically, uh, not necessarily magnetically, but electrically so they don't short out, but then they coat the entire thing, this particular one with powder, powder coating that uh, further insulates the, uh, the blank. Standard 6-ohm armatures, they're 14 laminations. Uh, commutators can be primarily what I call a, a nylon commutator where um, you've got a nylon core and then you've got these plates that are placed onto that core and then there's a ring right here that's pushed down over the top of that that holds all that together. That's fine for your, your, your common light duty applications where these kinds of motors here with the uh, powder coated blanks and this what they call a Bakelite commutator can take a lot more uh, abuse, a lot more heat in that. So, all right, you, you've heard the term brush barrel timed and end bell timed. Um, that's a real important concept because you can't run a, what traditionally is called a Tyco timed armature or a brush barrel timed armature in an end bell car uh, such as a Viper, uh, Scale Auto, the Super 7 or CAN motor car. Um, if you look at a brush barrel car, the motor magnets and the brushes are on the same plane, okay? So in order for that motor that armature to become a magnet, they wind it a certain way so when the electricity energizes the lamination stack and then wants to pull itself into the static magnet, okay, it, it's timing. And there's two primary winding patterns. One is called a, uh, a Y wind and the other is called a delta. I can't tell you right off the top of my head which one of those goes to in bell and which one of them goes to brush barrel, but you know, you have a delta and then you have the uh, uh, Y wind, okay? And then also within all of that, then the orientation of the commutator is slightly different, all right? And I'll show you what that's, 
what that's about here. If you look at like a Tyco 440 or these Wizard Storm cars and line up the laminations at 12 o'clock in the car, what you'll notice is that the commutator segment lines up with the center of this. That's a dead giveaway. You know, when you've got a, an armature laying on the bench, what you have, okay? On an in-bell car, when you look at it straight up, the uh, commutator plate or gap is off to the left as you're looking at it like this. That's another dead giveaway. It's an in-bell motor. So on top of the, the pattern that the wires wound and the orientation of the commutator then basically sets the timing. So you end up with a situation of timing that's really not much different than you know, old school timing in your you know, uh, small block Chevys and Fords and stuff like that or whatever. Um, you can't take the distributor out of a Ford and stick it into a Chevy and vice versa and have it to work, but the concept between the two cars and the way that they, f the firing order and all that um, is the same principle. It's just a different mechanical design. Well, this is what you have with uh, in bell and brush barrel. Um, so, with an in bell car, when you look at the end bell inside, you'll see that the brushes are top to bottom or at 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock. Well, we have motor magnets that are at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock and brushes that are at 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock. Okay, so that's one reason why you can't motor this time to work in this. You can't stick in this where everything here is on the, the side plane. All right, there's just the motors you you swap one to the other, the other to one, you put it on the track and just sits there and hums. It won't fire over. It's out of time. A lot of people get a little intimidated with an in-bell car, but they're really not that bad. Um, I'm going to show you real quick how to put the motor in. You get one of these little spreader tools, and that spreads the... I don't know if you can see that or not. It spreads the brushes. And once it's spread, boom. Then you can pop that thing in just like that. Okay. Actually, it's pretty easy. Um, we sell a little tool that um, does the same thing, a little church key sort of thing, versus uh, if you're going to use one every day, you need one of these. All right. So then. You, depending on the car that you have, you have to get the right motor for it. And then when you're building it, you need bushings. That's another thing we're going to talk about. A Wizard Storm is a pretty simple car, really, at the end of the day. They're not that complicated. Pretty robust. Everything's laid out, easy to see. So it's easy to see real quick. You got a rear bushing and a front bushing. All right. And these are called flanged bushings. And it's real important because I've seen guys um, try to stuff anything in the world into these, like an unflanged bushing, and that's just not going to work. And we'll pick one of these up right here. Let's show these are. These particular ones are in an oil light style bushing. So you see that little flange on there? And there's no difference between the front and the back. They're both the same. All right. In bell car, the in bell holds the bushing. Okay. And let's take this apart here. You can see that, that that's a machine bronze bushing. Okay. Um, 
I've seen people win races with oil light bushings. It, there's a lot of things you can do. Oil light's perfectly good, especially if you ream it out, polish it. They're, they're not inferior to a machine bronze bushing. So um, the fancy part makes you feel better. Okay, that's fine. But uh, you can do well with an oil light bushing. Now within the Viper line, we've got a couple different style bushings. Okay, this is a, uh, our standard bushing here. And it's the same one front and back. Then there's another one here called a Pro Front. And I'll show you a diagram of that here so it'll make more sense to you. You'll see what's going on with that. And then the Pro Rear Bushing. So these are uh, drawings for the Viper bushings. And that's because you if you want to shop around and get the best price or whatever, you better have a you better have a model. So this is the side plane of the bushing, and you can see that it's pretty standard or whatever. It's chamfered, which is important, you know, for um, oil to get in and to make the armature easier to slide in. And that's our standard bushing front and rear. All right. Then you see this thing called a pro bushing, and you wonder really what it's about. And the key here is this feature right here, this little raised ring, okay? And why is that important, you say? Well, on our armatures, you have a fairly big contact patch. Well, the standard bushing with a flat face is going to contact that entire patch. The theory is, with the pro bushing, is maybe there's less friction, okay? Um, racing's a game at the margin. You take every opportunity that you can to do anything. So with the pro bushing, when you put that thing on, I don't know if you can see if there's any light in between that or not. You may see just a little bit of light. So your contact patch, if you think about it, get back to our drawing, our contact patch is now this small surface. This is actually more important if you use, if you're building a pro car, you get rid of those plastic washers on the front, take them off, at least one, and then you put a metal one on like that. So now you've got a metal washer that's contacting this particular surface there. And probably with the proper amount of oil will give you far better uh, performance. Then the pro bushing for the rear is a little different than the standard bushing. This feature is still the same here, still the same here. But then you've got this area here. All right, and what this does is this captivates the bushing in the chassis. So I'm not going to build up a motor and pop in, but I'm just going to grab the pro bushing right here and just pop that in by hand. So. As you see right there, that thing stays captive into that cavity. The bushing can't go forward, backwards. It really stays in place. That's kind of the point of it. You know, and the rules allow it, use it. So when you're building a race car, every little thing helps. It's not just willy-nilly parts. And I say all this, and I wanted to talk about this in this video, because I've seen people send me stuff to work on, Super G Plus, a Viper, Scale Auto, or whatever, and I've seen people try to cram these wizard flanged bushings in the car. Now they'll use a standard end bell, but they'll have that flanged bushing stuck back in here. Car runs, but you know, maybe not as good as it could. All right, and then part and parcel to 
all of this are spacers. Spacers are important. Um, you don't have to have them. Call run without it. But the whole idea behind spacers is to get the play out of out of the armature in here. So you want a little bit of perceptible play and if you see, I put my fingernail on that and move it. Let's see if I can get that to move a little bit better for you. There you go. See that moving right there? That's generally about enough. You don't want a lot more and you certainly don't want a lot less because if you have a little bit less and things heat up and expand, then you're putting the brakes onto your car. But what that does, when everything is properly spaced out, it keeps your motor in the magnetic field and keeps your commutator in the proper relationship to the motor brushes. Now there's a lot of measurements you can take when you're building these cars. I'm not going to get into any of that now, but uh, we do sell a line of spacers that um, you know, three, five, ten, fifteen, and twenty thousandths. So, you know, you build the car up a little bit and you check it and see, and like, well, you know, maybe I need a three. You take it all apart, put a three in there, check it again, and decide that that's right. Um, if you've got a lot of space, then, you know, you start with a 20 and then go from there. Um, cars that have ball bearings, you know, this is a bit of a problem. You have metal gears. You've got to build a whole car, figure out your spacing before you uh, solder your pinion on and get all of your spacers in there. This particular one's got a couple of tens in there on top of that ball bearing. Now, a lot of people think, let's while we're talking about ball bearings, on these low-end cars, like you know, when I say low-end, six ohm level four, the A bearings are going to make it go faster. There's no, I haven't seen any definitive proof that it does. Um, it, bearings aren't really there to like make the car or allow the car to go faster. If you think about it, think really critical about it, the ball bearing, You've got, you know, your ID, and you've got your race, and then you've got your um, your ring, and you've got all those little ball bearings in there floating around, and all contacting things and floating around. Now, there's not a whole lot of uh, friction there, but it's still there. Where on a good machine bushing, when your shaft is running through there, it's not an interference fit. So theoretically, that shaft can only touch one portion of the inside of this bushing at any point in time. Okay, that can't be much friction either. You know, especially if this is polished uh, bronze, like what these these pieces are. Your shaft, uh, the armature shaft, all this stuff is polished chrome. You know, uh, proper oil. You'll never, never know the difference on these low-end cars. The reason why you want bearings, and this is my opinion from what I've seen is you want it in these high-end Neo cars where you got a stiff chassis, you're running metal gears, and bearings tend to be very precise in terms of how much shims you can put in and get things really, really adjusted well. So you don't have a lot of fore and aft play in these cars at all because you don't want the gears to move around a lot. Let's see if I can get that to move. See, I can, I don't know if you can see that or not, but I can feel it. There's just probably maybe a thousandth worth of play in that. And the bearing allows you to um, kind of keep that uh, uh, very, very, uh, very precise uh, gear lash because one thing is it. Uh, the motor on some of these other cars can have a little bit of side play, a little bit. I can't feel that one there, but it's it's theoretically possible. A lot of guys will over ream um, these oil light bushings sometimes, and they have a lot of side play on these six ohm cars. But on these up up uh, high magnet cars, you don't have no side play at all in the armature. So then, 
the only thing you got to worry about is your side play on your uh, your gear. And we'll talk about this and these kinds of setups in uh, probably the next video after this. What do we got? Uh, yeah, the next video we'll talk about axles and gears. So we'll, we'll discuss this kind of a setup in that. But to me, that's the only place bearings are really needed. All right, so to kind of wrap up, you know, we've uh, talked about a lot of the mechanics. Um, and in the previous video, traction magnets and to some degree motor magnets are your artificial downforce. A lot of guys will say, you know, I'm going to put them level 10 magnets in my car and it's going to fix everything. You know, thinking that the motor magnets are going to help that car go faster. Well, you know, maybe, maybe not. Um, you need to match the strength of the motor magnets to the ohm rating of the armature. Generally, your standard 6 ohm cars, that armature is only going to pull effectively about level 4 magnets, level 4 motor magnets. If you get, you know, you put level 10s in there, it'll run, but the armature can't make itself as strong of an electromagnet as it needs to to spin within that really strong magnetic field, okay? And just like regular race cars, the more power and more speed you put, you got to have more wings and whatever to hold the thing on the track. So you take these uh, drop-in Neo cars, it has one ohm, three-quarter ohm motor, and of course you've got to have the Neo motor magnets to get that kind of speed out of it, but then you got level 52 traction magnets, and you saw in the previous video uh, how much uh, energy that these things put out to hold the thing down. So just as a rule of thumb, 6 ohm armature, level 4 motor magnets. Now you can build a level 4 car with level 10 traction magnets. That's possible. Okay, that's like adding a little bit of wing to the back of the car. However, you're probably not going to run the same size rear tires as you are on a level 4 car. You'll probably run on a little harder, a little taller, but it makes an, a kind of a more forgiving car to drive. You get into, say, an all level 10 uh, modified car, um, then you've got to uh, you can probably run like a two and a half, two ohm in that class. A lot of guys in compression molded modified are running two ohms in that. Uh, that's, that's a pretty stout armature for that, but it can be done. Um, there isn't any official classes after that that will take, say, level 25 or something like that. It goes right into NEO. And NEO is a bit of a, an open class. The only rule is essentially no glue, no screws. It has to be all snapped together, and then your car has to fit through a tech, tech block. So with that, when you have these low ohm motors in there, you need like level 52 or uh, level 42 motor magnets. And then guys that are built on you know play cars, which I would consider this thing right here, this 1025, um, that's just something that works good from the parts that we have, two and a half ohm armature. You can get by with plastic gears and something like this. So don't think that motor magnets, the strength of a motor magnet, can make the car go faster. Um, now you could run, let's go with a low ohm armature again, two and a half, two ohm. You could run a car with ceramic motor magnets like that that are very weak. The motor will run. How much work it's going to be able to do is another thing because it may be a little... It may want, it may, may not have as much torque as it likes because it doesn't have strong enough magnets. All right, so we've covered a lot of ground today. Um, I mean, I could talk on for hours. We don't got that kind of time. But, um, you know, if you can put some questions in the comment area, maybe I can read them and try to figure out what's going on. And maybe one day we'll do a master video on just answering questions or something. But uh, anyway, all right, so. We'll wrap it up for now, and uh, the next one will be axles and gears, and then another one after that maybe on tires, and then if we're really feeling good, we might do one on controllers. All right, thanks for uh, watching.